and I'm a master's student here um, in epidemiology at the School of Harvard uh, Chan Public Health. It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Henning Thiemeyer, who is also my amazing mentor and advisor. <laughs> Dr. Thiemeyer is professor of social and behavioral science and the Sumner and Esther Fel Felberg Chair of Maternal and Child Health at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Prior to joining Harvard, Dr. Thiemeyer held an appointment as professor of psychiatric epidemiology in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. He received both his medical and sociological degree from the University of Bonn, Germany, and his PhD from the Erasmus University in Rotterdam. Dr. Thiemeyer has published extensively on the etiology of child developmental problems with a particular focus on prenatal exposures. Work of his lab showed how genetic and early life exposure shaped the vulnerability to neurodevelopmental problems. Recent studies focus on brain development, both as a determinant and also as an outcome of child behavioral problems. Today, Dr. Thiemeyer will help talk about his future plans in maternal and child health. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Thiemeyer. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction, sweet introduction. Oh my, I've set myself up. I was partly responsible for this program and we've had such a wonderful talk on um, the future of MCH. Then we've had this look back to show the departmental strength and Marie and now comes myself uh, talking about the future. What a job. Okay, um, here we go. The future of MCH at Harvard. Forgive me if it's not a grand vision. Um, I'll start, just to distract you, uh, with this. I'll give you a bit of, you can't see it at the back, I'll show you a bit better. Um, now, I inherited many things, among which a wonderful room from Marie with some files left. I don't think they made it to the countway. And one of these days, um, one of these days, I went there to read the works of Marie and others, and this is my favorite. It is truly my favorite, and I mean that seriously. Um, among many others. I've got 20 favorites of Marie's. But um, so I don't know what way we talk about this one. I can just, as you can read something. The gist is, and then we'll move on. This is a wonderfully scholar work. It, it just has this wonderful, you know, it's the Russian Revolution, the changing the healthcare system, how it goes completely wrong, how it, and at that time you had a bit more sympathy than later for the medical profession, but here you felt they were, anyway. It is a wonderful read. I recommend it. It's just brilliant. And you didn't like bureaucracy even then in all senses of the word. OK, here we go. Um, the future of MCH at Harvard. We have to move on. What is the future? I think, um, and I think it's wonderful because it fits in some ways very nicely with what Michael has been saying. I think the future of MCH always is that at Harvard particularly, we have the best students. And I think coming here to teach from outside, it was really quite remarkable how motivated, how talented the students and how diverse the students are. So, and why do the students come? I asked them, you know, what, what, do you, what do you want to do, MCH? What do you expect? And um, they say, of course, we want good teaching. We get good teaching. We want good research. But we, what we really want to do, and that's for, speaking for largely for our many students, but really for the MCH students, they want to help. They want to make an impact. They want to change society. So they want to Implementation, they talked about you know, things that I was not so familiar, practice, policy, translation of the breath. They really were enthusiastic. I interviewed about six or seven, so it's not very systematic, but it, was, it struck me. Yeah, it's very small, there's many, but you know, then I stopped because it was always, they were motivated. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Um, now, there is a bit of a dilemma because MCH focuses very much on practice. I would say it's an outsider at the Harvard School of Public Health, and we have to re realize that because HSPH, we are very strong in research. We do develop interventions, there's no doubt. But are we so good in practice? And that was what these students want. And I think one of the um, challenges for MCH in the future is to keep up that balance, to train them in research, to train in practice, but also, and I want to tell you, we need more senior students in MCH that only, not only do, uh, not only, sorry, don't get me wrong, you know, I know you, but that go on to do a PhD that are postdocs in MCH. That is one of the things that, if we have such a wonderful talent pool, although I think they should go into practice, they should, but they should perhaps come back, they should stay, they could do practice research, there's a lot to do. And we can even develop a bit more 
mid-career mentoring in MCH. So one of the things I want to take home, and how can we do it? We need training grants, we need research to educate for practice, we will develop leadership labs, I can't go into the details, and we have, we'll have some partnerships. I'll just mention one we are strongly developing, was the Ariadne Labs, which is so strong in MCH, and there has been surprisingly little. And just a few things, and then I'll go to the bigger picture, because I think little things do matter too. The first thing that my program manager and I did, or program develop, uh, coordinator, with any Kotler, is we have two things. We joined arms, I would say, with an internal health task force, where we now strongly run it with them together to give it a much more one of the foci or one focus is also should be on domestic, which it hasn't been. You've heard a lot in the last weeks. That's we are working together. It's now called Maternal Task Force at the Center of Excellence. I'm very proud of that. And we're sending around the digest. I think these small things matter because did you know that they have 33,000 followers and there are many of them open and read the mail. So that's the thing. I want to show this because when I came again, you know, coming from the Netherlands, this was the slide of the year or the last years, and it's Michael Liu has probably shown it hundreds of times. This is just unbelievable what's happening, and you know it, so I can move on, really. The one thing I want to show you is that it, you can overlay it with other um, curves like the death of despair, and that struck me. You know, you can physically overlay it, and there's, I found, I know of three other curves that can also be overlaid. So, indeed, it says everything that how can this, and then again, I ask my students, what are the causes of infant? And I must tell you, even in the seven interviews, or seven was actually, I mixed infant and maternal mortality, so I sort of did, but you know, the answers were always, what should you do? What are the interventions? They came up with, for me, very interesting, because it's education, they said, housing, poverty are the issues. They really had the list of root causes of cortical shock. They had it on their list, and uh, father absence is on that list, but it's not mentioned. And the other one, that was my favorite quote. Two literally said, you know, just a healthcare system that sucks. Um, <laughs> which is, you know, and you know, if I look at this slide, I'll give you one thing. I do see the issues mentioned by Michael and others of, uh, dis you know, income inequality, poverty. But I also must tell you that this mortality in sort of, as a medical doctor, it means that there has been, in those years between 2006 or 2015, a 45% rise in also in complications, in hemorrhages, non-fetal, in renal failure, in shock. So for every one woman, and you can calculate how many women sort of died extra if you would have drawn the curve as the other European countries, there is literally, not hundreds for every woman, but quite a few, perhaps 50, up to 50, that have things like renal failure. So I will go back to, you know, I also think that this, it may be the causes of despair. It certainly is. I think there is two causes that you can argue are things like racism cause. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is there is also, indeed, a problem, I would argue, in the healthcare system. And those who are in the details know that California has done it better. So what do we do against that background? So we do need prevention, but I also argue forcefully, Michael, we may disagree here, we need harm reduction and immigration too. Um, and so we need both as strategies for MCH. And it's not exclusive, but you know, to change that tide, you know, it'll take a while before we have, you know, let's say the climate change, we have to do immigration. I'm afraid we have to. So I think the future of MCH is doing a bit of everything or everything well. I can tell you, I think we want to continue with epidemiology. I'll, I'll give you one example just to co convince you. We need to study vulnerable populations, perhaps the most vulnerable. I'll give you examples of what we will do. And we need to do develop interventions and, of course, evaluate them. So that is a long list. Um, perhaps the cohorts quickly, it can be ups working with existing cohorts here in Harvard. We have Viva, we have ABCD, we have, I think, and I'll come to that a minute later, we can also do global work in MCH. I don't think it's exclusive. I'll give you one example from Generation R. That's a study in Rotterdam, after Rotterdam, where I come from. And it was just about the C-section. Again, you know the slides, you know, C-section, not in the last years, but it has been going up dramatically. We've reached perhaps a plateau, but that plateau is about 30%. Depending on what you look at, it could be 25%. It's first or second pregnancy, it doesn't really matter. It's very high. Not as high as Brazil, but higher than most other, for example, developed countries in Europe. Um, there's different activities. I know the Ariadne Labs does apps to inform mothers about C-section. I bet they will have little effect. I will challenge you on that one. Um, you might educate providers. 
that will have perhaps a bit more effect about how helpful or not helpful fetal monitoring is and um, the unnecessary induction, which I would all call in a way, you know, harm reduction. But I also give you why cohort studies are important. Just one, two, actually two slides. It's about brain development. I come from a population neuroscience background. For me, it's fascinating to see how in some instances, mostly not, but in some instances, that can go together as MCH, like even genetics, I would argue, in some. This is an unpublished figure. I asked the PhD student, uh, no, actually a master student, to do that for me, and we controlled it, and we are now working on the publication. In this study, we have brain images of 3,000 children at age 10. Essentially, it was in a very narrow age range. But we also, because it's a prenatal population cohort where every child got in one site its echo very early in pregnancy. So it is very early in pregnancy. We're talking about week 12 echoes, plus minus four weeks, at two dedicated centers in Rotterdam. Plus we've got the menstrual history. We've got a very exact timing. It is, the Yama said, it's the most exact timing that any cohort study has managed. We have followed these people, these children, for 10 years now. And here is the relation between the gestational age at birth and the brain volume. Brain volume is the most crude of all markers, but why would you have a clear hypothesis? It's just a linear trend. There's two things which make it, why on earth does it go linear on in post-term? And why do you have so many post-term? At that time, we had the baby knows best policy. We had no induction at 43 weeks. This comes from a country with one of the lowest infant mortalities. And we just see for every day you're in utero, I manage, thanks, you have a bigger brain. And then you think, well, 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 that's all. But then I'll give you a more detailed, there's two other pictures. It's not causation, I know, it's, it's, it's not even causality, it's all, yeah, it's just uh, association. But it's interesting because here are two results. One of them on the left would be cortical development, the other is gyrification. Now that one is sort of the thickness of your gray matter, just the other one is the folding. Now it's interesting because in the last trimester it's the folding that develops. And what is colorful is the difference. That means we see no thickness difference. We only see the folding difference, which fits exactly to the time they stay in longer in utero. So for those in neuroscience, this is exciting epi. And it will make an argument that I can calculate for every day you're induced as a cesarean section, I can calculate the volume of your brain that you lose. Another thing is we have started a study, we've got funding of 4,000 preconception brain images, just another story, where we will postnatal, we will do preconception imaging and postnatal, just to address the simple question, what happens in these female brains during delivery? It seems to be some evidence, this is the Boston Globe talking about motherhood brings the most dramatic brain changes of a woman's life. I'm not sure I agree with that headline, but even subtle effects would be very important to better understand. Okay, now the real plans we have, the concrete plans. Two studies I would like to, so it's not the vision, it's just the plans. Early birds, we name it together as two very, very nice. One of them you can see here, Jonathan Litt and Mandy Belfort, two collaborators, an neonatologist, and many others like Dwayne, the speaker. We want to set up a Boston preterm, an early bird cohort to study with all the Boston hospitals, including BU, Mass General, to put together. It's more like a data collection project, a platform to do studies. And we want to study another project, different group of people, homeless families. And it's not only homeless, I'll talk about that in a minute. What do we want to study with the preterms? Different topics, but I, one of them, I think it's a very basic thing. Not You've seen what Maria studied, but I would also study the basic process, believe it or not, of aging. So I'm back to this child and aging department one day. If ever we can manage, we will study childhood and aging because I think the pre there's less reserve and less resilience in these children. But we can also study behavioral economics just to encourage, and there we get to real important questions. You could say, how can we encourage more parental care of these vulnerable populations? Because I think there's good work from Marie, if you read it carefully, showing that that matters. Just about the housing, essentially there is I'll go through it very quickly. There is a natural experiment. It's not so natural, actually, but there's an experiment in Boston going on with the housing bubble and the right to shelter. That we have a city with the most in absolute numbers next to New York and homeless families. We've got 1,500 children and so families, members of a family, every night in the shelters of Boston. And we have very little studies of them. We have one very successful program, that's the Horizons for Homeless Children, but we 
this is a group we can show, I would argue, what education, early education and maternal support matters. I think it's a very powerful design to develop for this specific group, but also for the bigger group of instable housing, insecure housing, to develop and what are the most effective, not only the effective, what are the most you know, multi-intervention measures of maternal support and education for this group, which we then can upscale to other vulnerable groups. So I'll stop. I think my time is leaving. I think um, implementation, there is a bit of a dilemma. I've shown you a bit of dilemmas. I see that Harvard School is very good in research. We have much less sort of close partnerships with um, Title V or public health services than other schools of public health. I would argue, probably most people would disagree. But actually, due to Marie's work, MCH has a few assets. One of them is the CDC program evaluation. We have a connections to the Center of Developing Child. We have some Title V collaboration, which I think we must deepen, invest in, because that is the manner to study implementation, not on its own. That is the message of the future. It is we can't do it. So that would be the transdisciplinary of Michael. And the last, I put it there sort of a bit excusing, I think domestic and global should not be at odds with each other. You notice that I work with Anna Langer because I do strongly believe that we have the same problems. And that's not just because we're number 28 uh, of the maternal mortality among other developing countries. There is good scientific reasons that we can learn from them, we can benefit, but we can also bring things to the table. So in summary, it is a center of excellence, training PhDs and postdocs, data collection. I told you all. I want to end again with, this is my favorite picture. It's a beautiful picture of Marie with pediatrics, I would say. It's a beautiful picture. So this is uh, Marie McCormick. I'm very, very, very thankful for the support she's given me, the group, the way she did it, and that she's still around. In a way, I'm even thankful for Bob, who, because of accidents, enabled her to stay a bit longer. That's a bit cynical, but it is, comes from heart. And that is, the future is also MCH at Harvard. It should be, it was, it will be a home, an intellectual and a social home. This was Tuesday's, honestly, this is a picture from Tuesday night when 27 MCH concentrators, as we call them, funny word, concentrators, graduate students mostly, came and we went out to a nice restaurant um, and had tapas. So that's the last Tuesday's event. It is a social home too, and that's Bethany who organized it with me. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>